chairing uh, this first panel and then the third panel while mm -hmm. Melinda Crane, who's here in the audience, will chair the other two. Uh, before we start, I just want to uh, say a word of thanks to the ECB and to Ignazio Angeloni for inviting me here today. Uh, throughout these years, I've had the pleasure of uh, ma having many exchanges with uh, Ignazio, who's uh, really enlightened me on the world of uh, banking supervision, which can be rather obscure uh, at times. Um, I really appreciated those exchanges we had, and uh, I look forward to his many contributions, which I'm sure will come in the years ahead uh, in his new life outside of the ECB, if a life outside the ECB is possible, I don't know. Um, but before we, so let me, let me start by introducing the, the speakers of, uh, of this panel. Uh, the first uh, intervention will be by uh, Guido Tabellini, who will be the leader speaker, uh, leading speaker of this, uh, of this first panel. Uh, Guido is Intesa San Paolo Chair uh, in Economics at Bocconi University in Milan, and he will speak for 20 minutes, uh, mainly talking about a paper he's been writing on uh, uh, whether Europe is an optimal political area. And then after that, we'll have uh, two discussants. First will be Daniel Gross. Uh, from the uh, Center for European Policy Studies, and then uh, Beatrice uh, Vedder Di Mauro, who's a professor at the Graduate Institute in Geneva and uh, in Singapore as well, at the INSEAD um, Emerging Market Institute, and is also the president of the CPR. Uh, so I will uh, start with Professor Tabellini, who has 20 minutes, and then at the end there will be time for uh, questions both from me and from the floor. Thank you. Okay, good morning, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you to Ignazio in particular. I met Ignazio for the first time many, many years ago. We were both uh, young teaching assistants at uh, Bocconi University, and uh, since then we kept in touch and interacted in many ways. So I want to start by uh, presenting some ideas in a, a joint work with Alberto Alesina and Francesco Trebbi, uh, but then I will uh, deviate from that and at the end and add my own personal thoughts about uh, these issues. So uh, this is how two European countries uh, saw each other a few years ago. Uh, uh, on the left, uh, how Germany was uh, looking at Greece. On the right, how, Ger how Greece was looking at, uh, at Germany. So these two pictures uh, uh, would suggest that it's not very encouraging to think about uh, political integration in Europe because we are just too different, there is not enough trust uh, uh, and, uh, and mutual respect. And in this paper, I want to suggest that this is actually not necessarily the case and uh, the uh, stumbling blocks towards further integration is not that, they, that we are very different uh, as uh, uh, European citizens, but lies uh, elsewhere. Um, and uh, in uh, thinking about these issues, um, I want to use a concept that was uh, uh, introduced uh, years ago, first by Robert Barrow and then elaborated further by Alberto Lesina with uh, Spolaore, uh, namely that to think about uh, uh, whether uh, an area is an optimal political union, we should think about an optimal trade-off between the benefits and the cost of political integration. The benefits uh, are exploiting uh, the economies of scale and scope in public good provision, that typically would be larger if uh, you're bigger, uh, and uh, the costs, according to uh, this literature, is heterogeneity in preferences. Uh, some people will be in a minority, and if we are very different, it will be more difficult to bargain and to, to come to efficient uh, decisions. Now, if you think about this trade-off, it's uh, pretty obvious to European citizens, not to elites, but uh, to European citizens, that uh, the economies of scale and scope in further integration in some areas are very large. This is how respondents to the Eurobarometer in 2016 uh, answered uh, the question of whether they were in favor of uh, more EU-level decision-making in these areas. And as you see, a predominant majority uh, is in favor of more 
decision making at the EU level in fighting terrorism, in promoting peace and democracy and foreign policy, environmental policy, immigration policy, uh, and energy. Uh, so what we do in this paper is to try and uh, evaluate the other part of the, of the trade-off, namely how different uh, are we in uh, assessing policies. And in particular, uh, we focus on, on deep cultural heterogeneity between European citizens, and we also ask whether uh, integration has uh, made the integration that we have seen in Europe through mobility, exchange of people, trade, has made this trade-off uh, uh, between economies of scale and heterogeneity more or less favorable over time. Uh, and so these are the specific questions that I want to address. How different are European citizens in their deep cultural traits? Uh, and the benchmark of comparison is uh, within country heterogeneity and also the US. Uh, and then, uh, have we become more similar or more different uh, from each other over time? And then I will conclude with some discussions. The sample of countries is uh, the EU15 plus Norway. I'm not sure why Norway is in the sample. We started with it and we never excluded it. But the important point to note is that uh, Central and Eastern Europe is not uh, in the sample. And also, the questions that we exploit and before the uh, financial crisis in 2008. Uh, so since then, maybe things have slightly changed. Uh, and we take from uh, the European Value Survey, a broad uh, national survey that uh, has been asked in, in these countries regularly, uh, 20 questions on deeply held uh, cultural traits. We think of integration as a marriage. When you enter into a marriage, you don't want to ask about taste for food or wine. You want to enter into a very incomplete contract, and you want to know whether you share the same vision of life as your partner. And so here, we look at uh, very deep uh, features that uh, previous literature on the subject has shown to be fairly stable over time and persistent. So religiosity, not, not religion, but how religious you are, issues about uh, the role of women in society and in the marketplace, uh, issues about sexual morality, uh, issues about uh, the role of the state uh, redistrib on redistribution versus individual responsibility, on the protection of property rights, uh, on political ideologies. Uh, and then uh, uh, specific values and civic capital like generalized trust, qualities uh, that you appreciate in children like hard work, unselfishness, uh, obedience, uh, or your willingness to self-determinate uh, your, your fate in life. And let me emphasize that the results that I'm going to present are fairly robust uh, to only considering a subset of these issues. Uh, so the first question is, how different are we? So we have, uh, think of, of this as a, 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 of a, a data point in our sample as a, a vector in, in a 20 dimensional space. So 20 individual, each individual responds to 20 questions. And then we uh, formalize our analysis in the following way, we take two individuals at random within each country, two Italians, and two individuals at random belonging to different countries, an Italian and a German, uh, and we ask uh, how different are they, how different are these two vectors of 20 responses. Okay? Uh, and this is the distribution of uh, uh, bilateral distances. The solid line is uh, for two random individuals, uh, sorry, for two individuals belonging to different countries. And uh, the dotted line is uh, uh, the bilateral, the distribution of bilateral distances for two individuals belonging to the same country. On the left, it's the raw data. On the right, it's uh, after you condition on uh, individual features such as age, gender, education, and so on. Uh, and so, as you see, the distribution goes from zero to one uh, by design. These questions have been scaled and normalized so that uh, the distribution lies in this range. But what is striking 
about this picture that we didn't expect when we started this project is that two distributions are very similar. The average distance for individuals belonging to different countries is only about five percentage higher than the average distance for individuals of the same country. So we are very similar. And this is not because we are similar, but because we are very different within countries. So we tend to forget the extent of huge heterogeneity that there is within uh, each of these well-functioning democracies. Uh, and I think that's, that's the core message of the paper in the end. Um, then we uh, ask a second question. Uh, we ask, what is the cultural average of these traits in Europe? So we have all these uh, many vectors. We compute the centroid. So think of this as the, as the vector average of these cultural traits. Uh, and then we can compute the distance of each individual from this uh, average European cultural trait. And because we know the region of residence of each of these respondents, we can compute the average cultural distance of each region from the cultural center of Europe. Okay. And, and this is shown in this map. Uh, lighter color are closer to the cultural average of Europe. Darker color are further away. Uh, the Switzerland is missing, so it's not a very light color. But what this map is telling you is that the lighter color are here in Germany. So the cultural core of Europe coincides with Germany. It's the regions that are uh, closer to the average European cultural traits. Notice that this is unweighted by population. If we weighted by population, this, of course, would be true even more. Uh, so there is a sense in which the cultural core coincides with the economic core. Uh, however, perhaps surprisingly, it's not true that the economic periphery is also a cultural periphery. Spain uh, is closer to the cultural center than France. And France, uh, as we know, is a bit peculiar in its uh, cultural traits. So, <laughs> uh, so, so I think the messages here are the cultural core coincides with the economic core. The cultural periphery does not coincide with the economic periphery. There is also, as you see, a lot of heterogeneity within countries uh, uh, and, and, within, and within regions. Uh, we also, I don't have time to show the results, but we also relate this individual distance from the cultural center to uh, individual attitudes towards European integration. And not surprisingly, individuals who are closer to the center in terms of cultural traits are more in favor of European integration, suggesting that this is not such a bad measure. But nevertheless, European attitudes in favor of European integration are largely unexplained. So that's a I guess a further point to substantiate that this cultural difference maybe are not, not so uh, relevant. Uh, so that's the conclusion from to, to the first question. We don't differ so much relative to heterogeneity within countries. Then we repeat the same exercise for the US. Uh, here uh, uh, we use another survey. We only use 15 questions because we want to make sure that they are identical to those that are asked uh, in the US. Uh, in, in Europe, uh, we aggregate respondents uh, so that we have enough respondents uh, by area. This leaves us either with nine large states or with five US macro regions. The results are similar. Uh, and uh, uh, this is what happens. So the, the, the top, again, the, the left is the unconditional distributions, the right is the conditional distributions after you take into account individual features. The top is uh, the distribution of bilateral distances for two US citizens belonging to the same state or to different states. You see only one distribution because it's, they are superimposed. So uh, this suggests that in the US, uh, uh, the heterogeneity within states is essentially the same as the heterogeneity between states. Uh, so maybe this is because uh, there is less heterogeneity between states than 
in, in the US than there is in Europe. This is not actually the case. So uh, the remaining two uh, uh, rows show that, uh, uh, so this is the uh, uh, Europe versus the US within states and Europe versus the US uh, between states or countries. And, and what those two rows say is that within states, there is more heterogeneity in the US than in Europe. But between states, there is the same heterogeneity in the US as between European countries. So uh, again, same conclusions. If we compare the US and Europe, the extent of uh, cultural heterogeneity is essentially the same in these two areas. Uh, last question, has uh, the cultural heterogeneity decreased or increased over time in Europe? Uh, and uh, a priori could go either way. You would expect that further integration, mobility of people, trade has made us more similar, but the trade also leads to more specialization, so maybe we have uh, diverged. Um, and the answer is we have diverged. So this is uh, now uh, uh, plotting uh, distributions in the first wave, so 1980, and in the last wave, 30 years later, 2008. Uh, the first row is uh, uh, the uh, distribution uh, for individuals uh, belonging to different countries. And uh, uh, the dotted line is uh, 1980. The solid line is uh, uh, 2008. So the distribution has shifted to the right, meaning that we have become more different between 1980 and 2008. Okay. However, the same has happened uh, within countries. So the second row plots the distribution in 1980 and 2008 for individuals belonging to the same country. And again, there has been some cultural divergence there as well. So the bottom line is, yes, we have become more different, about five, a bit more than 5% in terms of average distance. But it cannot be blamed on uh, European integration per se because the same phenomenon has occurred within countries. And when we look at the US, the same phenomenon has also occurred in the US. So perhaps it's a general feature of the fact that we have uh, that the knowledge economy induces more polarization within countries between uh, more educated and less educated. And, and what we are seeing is a result of that. Uh, we also look at more specific cultural traits. I don't have time to, to go at the details, but the bottom line is that uh, uh, behind uh, this uh, divergence between countries that uh, I have illustrated, there is uh, uh, some uh, evidence of divergence between Northern Europe and Southern Europe. So all Europeans have become more modern in their cultural traits, uh, but Northern Europe has done so at a faster rate than, than Southern Europe. And uh, uh, this, unfortunately, has also taken place uh, in the functioning of institutions. I don't have time to go over this. Maybe somebody else will comment, but the paper shows that uh, this is uh, uh, also happening, a little bit of institutional divergence due to Northern Europe gaining uh, in the functioning of its institutions and Southern Europe uh, uh, lagging further behind. So uh, that's the answer to the last question. So let me. Uh, conclude with uh, some discussion. So I started by referring to the idea that uh, in choosing whether or not to integrate, we should look at the trade-off between economies of scale in public good provision versus the cost of heterogeneity. What this analysis suggests is that the stumbling block that is preventing further European political integration should not be thought of as uh, heterogeneity in least uh, deep uh, policy or cultural preferences. So I'm not just saying that we are ready to integrate tomorrow. Uh, I'm saying that we ought to look for uh, the stumbling blocks elsewhere. And I think there are two areas where we should look. One is. Uh, uh, identification with the nation versus Europe. 
because of languages, because of histories, we are more willing to compromise with our different Italians uh, than we are with uh, members of other nationalities. Uh, and so uh, national identities rather than European identities is one big issue, uh, which suggests that these national identities are somehow also leading us to stereotype differences and to have prejudices that make us uh, uh, less, less eff effective in, in working together. The second issue is probably related to economic asymmetries and economic divergences that is creating mistrust, as in the initial slide of uh, Greece and, and Germany. So let me just show you a couple of data on this. This is uh, uh, the percentage of people who are proud of their national identities in these same surveys. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the message here is not very reassuring if you want to think about European integration, because in all countries, uh, there is an increasing trend in nationalism. This is before 2000, uh, it ends in 2008. So the financial crisis probably uh, increased this uh, much further. There is a lot of heterogeneity between countries, but uh, the trend in nationalism is uh, uh, a long-term trend. It's not just due to the financial crisis. Uh, if you look at another question, the message is a bit more reassuring. Uh, there is a question that asks whether you feel both European and uh, national. And the trend there fluctuates, but it is stable over time. So we are more proud of our national identities. We are not necessarily feeling less European. Uh, the second point, namely the importance of uh, economics and economic divergences, is also relevant. And here I'm illustrating the percentage of people from the Eurobarometer who perceive European uh, membership as a benefit on the vertical axis. On the horizontal axis, uh, the unemployment rate. Both are changes. And the change is measured between uh, the beginning uh, of the <coughs> financial crisis and 2013, arguably the end of it. And you see that uh, where unemployment increased more, uh, the percentage of people in favor of European integration uh, has uh, dropped, uh, and where instead unemployment has been stable or reduced, uh, the opposite is true. This is true also in a longer time horizon between 2002 and 2017. It's true for other questions uh, like, like uh, making my voice count and whether I think that my voice counts in the European Union. So what these data are suggesting is that my attitudes towards European integration uh, are uh, very much affected by uh, economic conditions, uh, and uh, particularly so during uh, the financial crisis, but m more generally. And this has also been established in, in other independent research. So to close, uh, what are the implications uh, of, uh, of these uh, facts and these ideas uh, for uh, uh, people who want to uh, push further European integration in, in other political areas. Well, I think I've listed four points. We should pay attention to economic divergence, uh, particularly within the Eurozone, because uh, uh, this is a stumbling block. So this suggests that economic divergence is not only a national problem, it's also a European problem that, of course, uh, should, should matter for all. Second, if we think at uh, how to overcome nationalism, looking at the history of national member states suggests that education should play a fundamental role. Public schooling was designed uh, on purpose to foster uh, a sense of national identification. Uh, and there is nothing wrong in thinking that we can do the same to some degree by coordinating on some features of European school curricula that would emphasize uh, teaching about uh, 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 European heroes, uh, but also about the European institutions to foster a greater sense of identification. Uh, third, the method with which uh, integration is achieved also matters. Uh, 
Of course, if integration is achieved through the intergovernmental methods, this is going to reinforce national identities because politicians will want to bring trophies at home. If instead we achieve integration by designing common institutions like the ECB, uh, this is more likely to foster national identification. Uh, and finally, uh, of course, uh, let me just remember that Eastern Europe is not included here and maybe the results that I presented would not apply to all of these countries. Thank you. Good morning, and uh, let me also add that uh, I'm honored uh, to be here. And uh, I have a task, ta <coughs> tough <coughs> task here as a discussant of uh, an excellent and provocative paper and an introduction by Ignazio, which uh, focused on uh, his own uh, career and the issues uh, of the institution in which he is leaving, namely the challenges for supervisors and central banks. So, is there... Um, did you take the... Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So what I wanted to do is perhaps to limit uh, myself to two comments, which try to look at the intersection between uh, the overarching theme which Ignazio proposed and the very broad sweep uh, which then uh, Guido went into. <coughs> Namely, what are the challenges uh, for supervisors central bank uh, in the European context? Um, and as you have just heard, the, the message from, from Guido is essentially a positive one. Uh, he's saying we shouldn't have more difficulties than the U.S., comma, and then the U.S. is a well-functioning monetary union. Okay, that second part, I think we have to put some doubts, uh, some question marks behind, but let us uh, accept uh, that part. So uh, let me therefore concentrate on two specific points, uh, the points uh, which he also then took up in his conclusions, uh, namely economic divergence uh, in the EU and how important that is for the acceptance and the political underpinning. And uh, then uh, the key issue raised by Ignazio, which is one of, of independence. And uh, here I wanted to come back to the specific European uh, context uh, which, in my view, uh, at least if it looks at recent developments, raises additional challenges to the ones that Ignacio already mentioned earlier this morning. So the first point is basically just a graph uh, which uh, showed, uh, which uh, Guido had just shown, uh, which uh, just takes his curve of the relationship between uh, people who think that EU uh, membership is a good thing and the change in unemployment rates. And the interesting point which uh, comes out of that graph, which uh, is mentioned that if you go whoop, right to the zero change line, then you see actually you have an increase in the popularity of the EU. So for a country, and that should be the average, right, which has zero change in the long run of uh, in its unemployment rate, actually the popularity of the EU has increased. So my point would be that what is really important for the EU is not so much this horizontal, but the vertical position of the curve. So if you just take then the levels, this curve seems to have shifted between 2002 and today. And that is what I find encouraging, and that is what I would uh, put forward as perhaps one of the, the key findings, uh, which is that uh, even uh, when, if you have very large differences in economic performance, still on average, the popularity of the EU uh, has increased uh, considerably over the long term. And that has also implication uh, more broadly when I take uh, one point which came up uh, obliquely only in Ignacio's presentation, namely that the supervisor is the defender of the public interest, comma, of the taxpayer. You said everybody is a taxpayer. Now, we all know that in Europe we have in the first instance, national taxpayers. They feel they are paying nationally. And 
then delegating that authority to have uh, um, decisions being made by an organization in which the national representative is only a very small part of the overall decision-making process creates some difficulties. But those difficulties are, of course, mitigated to the extent that people think uh, we are part of a bigger whole, the EU. And uh, my point of view would be that uh, part of the fact that we were able to go from basically zero European input into very strong European input in uh, supervision was also due to the fact that uh, in 2000, when you started, um, there was le very little feeling of, or very m less strong feeling of being part of the EU. And therefore, the facile argument, supervision has fiscal consequences, fiscal policy is national, and therefore, it has to remain national. That argument has become less strong over time. And of course, this banking crisis added uh, an additional element to it, an important one. But I think that was also behind that shift which you have seen in your career in Atium. But let me come back to a second point which uh, Guido mentioned en passant, which is the divergence in uh, institution, or special institutional quality. I'm showing you here just a graph which is uh, in his paper. Um, which says that the difference in the quality uh, of the institution, of the local, national, legal institutions has increased. And I think that is one of the key challenges in a number of member countries. Uh, fortunately, these are usually what one would call peripheral member countries. But when we talk about in independence, we usually take as granted we have institutional provisions, comma, and they work, right? It's written in the law. Unfortunately, uh, that presupposes that the legal institutions works, that the judiciary works. And in some countries, that is not the case. In some countries, that is perhaps less the case, right? It's not zero one. Um, and uh, that is, uh, as a matter of fact, actually one of the biggest problems uh, facing supervisors in many uh, countries in the EU. And that's why this divergence in the institutional quality that Guido shows is so important. Now, what is to be done? Now, assuming still that the EU legal framework works well, as it is written in statute, then the first reaction would be, perhaps we should reduce even further the room for maneuver and for discretion of the national authorities. Right? Not because it might be the optimum for everybody, but because unfortunately there's a number of countries where we cannot trust that the uh, legal institutions might not be misused by either political or, or actually economic interests. And the second point would be that we need mechanisms to protect the de facto independence of national supervisors thinking about the National Public Prosecutor, actions the ECB is undertaking, and, and so on. Uh, this might be uh, very important steps that we need to take to, so that the, the trust in everybody in the quality of our uh, supervisory framework remains intact. And the last point for me is actually open. Assuming that the problems of legality remain uh, limited to a few uh, peripheral countries. But the key question still is, what, is, what are the incentives for a supervisor who might face threats at home, but threats which are usually linked to national interests, what incentive does he or she face when operating in a European context, when having to contribute to decision about other cases? Uh, because this is what uh, the, the, the de facto state of affairs which we have in Europe. We have a European supervisor, but decisions are being made by national, res or with a large input by national representatives, or by people nominated at the national level. What are their incentives? Uh, how will they react? Um, and uh, I think this is a further issue, perhaps, which Ignacio might want to address in his Unruhestand. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.
it's a great honor to be here. And um, thank you, Ignacio, for bringing me uh, to a place that feels very much like home. Um, I, the countless times that I came to this room to participate in seminars, in uh, speeches, conferences, this, this was the ECB uh, for many of us. And uh, it reminds us of how small it started and not so long ago and how far it's gone. And you know, the same is of course true uh, for you, Ignacio. Um, you have been not only uh, somebody on the way of the ECB, but very much also wake, making the way of the ECB. So um, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to, uh, to reflect on these uh, political, um, in these diff difficult political times in, the, uh, in which we are in Europe, to reflect uh, based on a paper that, is, uh, that, that uh, Guido and um, Alberto have uh, given us, which is actually gives us a lot of reason for optimism, at least that's the way I would put it, and this is also the way I would uh, interpret their results. Um, I have four points that uh, I want to make, uh, um, which are in the broader in the broader picture of uh, what uh, what they are raising here. Um, one is related to the typical way that we t we look at optimal currency uh, area theories and how much damage that actually does to our thinking. Um, then I want to look at one optimal currency area that is. Uh, probably also not an optimal one, but it's the US and how, what, what are the lessons that, uh, where, that we can draw from its formation. And then two brief uh, um, comments about the reasons behind the disunity and polarization that we are observing and the possible um, role that uh, the demography may be playing in trust. So first of all, uh, confession. Uh, yes, I also teach optimal currency area theory. Um, and uh, you know, when you are when you approach a, a course of a European monetary integration, that is uh, the framework that you kind of uh, are maybe not stuck with, but that you start from. And what is and, and but I also the confession is I don't like it. And why one of the reasons I don't like it is because I think there is a fundamental problem with it. And in fact, this is in a way what, uh, what, what Tabellini and Alessina are showing us here is it, there is an assumption behind it that the unit of account that we should be looking at, and that's of course the assumption shared in much, most of macro, is the country. That the country is actually something homogeneous, both in terms of its economic qualities, it gets shocks or doesn't get shocks, it's the I versus the Y that we look at, it has preferences and uh, they differ from the preferences in other countries and then we can start analyzing. And on many of the dimensions, both in the in the benefit area or in the, in, the, in the economic side of things, the country may not be the right unit of analysis. Uh, asymmetric shocks don't necessarily occur at country level. They may be at regional level. They may be at industrial level. Moreover, these things don't, don't, are not static over time. As economic integration happens, you know, as, as we know from agglomeration and other effects, this, this may very much change. And again, you know, the country level may be the wrong one to be analyzing. What they, and then, then what we do is we say, okay, so uh, optimal currency area, the Europe, whenever you do this analysis, you conclude, oh, you know, the, the, the euro is not an uh, optimal currency area. Um, so one of the things to, to, to look at then, you know, what cures it, how much mobility do you have? Um, and, but one of the aspects is also always, is it a, are we too different? Are the, are the preferences too different? And again, the assumption is you know, that preferences are somehow formed at the level of the country, that national identi identity is equal to national preferences. And, and you show that that's wrong. You know, that's, not, that's not Europe. That's, by the way, also not the US. Um, so, you know, this is actually the, the actual con uh, summary from one of my slides. So, yes, uh, the uh, euro, uh, monetary union, is not an optimal currency um, area, but, non but no other one that is existing today is an optimal one either. So, so maybe, so point here, you know, is maybe we have to think uh, of different frameworks of how we approach, because we are the, we all are uh, the, the slaves of defunct economists, and here very much, uh, oh, 
some, in some kinds living economists. And here very much, you know, Mandel is, is sort of a, um, having a strong influence on the way that we think about uh, costs and benefits of, uh, of the euro. Um, so if we go to the US uh, for a second, and I want to go more historically, using a, um, using a, uh, some results from a very recent uh, study, that, uh, a recent report that uh, Kierkegaard and Posen have put forward, and that are very interesting because they essentially show that not only the US is maybe not an optimal currency area today, but certainly it also was a very hard process of integration and federation making. So institution building at the federal level took various attempts um, and the various repeated attempts. Fiscal integration in the US took, uh, so took a century essential, uh, essentially in the making. Um, and very importantly, which I picked up here, and that resonates very much with us today, is that whenever there were steps towards centralization, this can very easily um, unite the opposition. So, so one of the quotes here is, you know, such negative coalitions that are fighting against centralization are very easy to form and maybe quite durable and easier to maintain than positive coalitions, which are arguing essentially for the need for a common good. And moreover, also something that resonates is that also in the forming of a union in the US, crisis played quite a big role. Moreover, security crisis seemed to have played an even larger role than economic crisis, which, is, uh, which, which I found uh, was quite interesting. And institutions built in the course of managing such crisis usually endured. They may have had some modification later on, but they usually endured. So, you know, in a way, again, I think this is a, it's a way of looking at the U.S. experience that uh, gives um, cause for some optimism. And now um, it seems that the rest of my slides has gone missing because I had a few more, so let me talk without, uh, without them. So the next point I was going to make is um, about the disunion uh, in the role of culture and what is the role of culture uh, versus um, economics. So, so we know because a lot of the polarization and a lot of the research that we have recently been seeing is that the financial crisis plays a big, plays a big role generally um, for, you know, for, for polarizing societies. So this is, this is a general pattern that is also confirmed in other countries and in emerging markets again and again. So that would be uh, something where we can say, well, if it's the financial crisis and if it's the polarization following from the suffering of the financial crisis, the unemployment, etc., this will eventually correct back. So this is not a permanent uh, effect. But on the other hand, if it is actually value-based uh, culture and identity which is driving our societies apart within countries and across, uh, then and, and maybe those things are more immutable. Um, maybe that those, those uh, problems are deeper, and therefore that would be more of a cause for pessimism. Um, so I think one of the questions that we really have to take very seriously is this identity uh, uh, is this question of who are we when we say we as Europeans? Um, who is the people? You know, Ignacio, you, you, you mentioned you know, the, the will of the people that is so often cited these days. You know, who is this people? Uh, is it the, the 51 that voted on a certain referendum? You, know, you saw the Swiss map, the Swiss Switzerland not being part of the, of the uh, analysis, unfortunately, but in Switzerland we actually have a lot of experience with voting and <laughs> referenda, and we do this on the on a regular basis. And the question, who is the who is the majority who decides, is very very closely uh, regulated because it is always a qualified, in a way, a supermajority. There is a process also that that um, that that makes sure that when a proposal is put forward when a proposal is put forward that the, the government can actually make a, uh, uh, an alternative proposal. So, so the, we cannot be defined simply by the question, you know, uh, you have a plebiscite and the uh, 50 plus one uh, person decides, and that is then by definition the people. That, uh, you know, we have to really clearly uh, go against this kind of trend that is being used by populists. 
Last point, uh, I'll be very brief here. Here I had a few slides that are uh, a few graphs that are quite interesting. The point is, you know, from this kind of value service and from this kind of service about who do you trust, national versus European institutions, what you do see is also a very interesting age cohort uh, pattern. And that's something that I find worrying. Um, if I interpret it uh, um, pessimistically, the result is um, that the older generations are more, becoming more nationalists, so they trust the European uh, and the European institutions less. Now, unfortunately, these ones is, that's the growing cohort. So the the, me, the, the uh, median voter is uh, is is aging, and uh, aging doesn't seem to be leading to more tolerance and more, you know, <laughs> broadening of uh, of the of, of, of identities uh, on average. Um, Whereas, you know, on the other side, the, the young people in these uh, surveys are becoming much more European and rather fast. So, so my last point, uh, my last slide was actually a, uh, a uh, la, la Rue de la, de la Loire uh, on Paris in, inundated with, you know, the uh, young people who are saying, you know, this is my future, this is our planet, uh, um, save it, uh, and, you know, you guys are responsible. I think that is actually... Uh, that is actually our responsibility. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, to all our speakers. I have a couple of questions which I'd like to ask before opening up to the floor. And uh, I think the first one is for Professor Tabellini more directly. And it's a curiosity uh, about his paper. I mean, you look at a number cultural preferences on a number of areas. I was wondering whether perhaps if you restrict the field to just economic preferences, and I'm thinking about, you know, for example, the attitude towards government spending, there could be more heterogeneity within, uh, between countries than within countries, and whether that could be a you know, constraining factor for the things that many of us in these rooms are, are concerned about. Uh, and the other question is whether maybe the problem is not so much heterogeneity between countries, but it's between voters and governments, i.e. maybe the European Union has been pushing an agenda which is different from what the voters wanted. And I'm thinking one example is, you know, what you're seeing today about the single market. Uh, one idea at the core of the EU has been the idea of the single market, but now you're starting to see a pushback from some governments in the direction of less competition policy. I'm thinking of what's happening from the French government and the German government about Alston Siemens, but also other cases. So I'm wondering whether here uh, there is some disconnect between the agenda which Europe has been pushing forward and um, what people wanted. And then I have a question for uh, uh, Professor Vedder and, and, and Daniel Gross is, uh, I mean, one message from this panel seems to be that actually m more integration is possible. And uh, you actually said it's desirable and actually, Professor Tabellini even said institutions may be the way forward as opposed to intergovernmental bargains. Trouble is, we're seeing exactly the opposite at the moment. We're seeing more intergovernmental uh, decisions, and we are seeing possibly integration reaching a limit on some areas like the completion of banking union, perhaps you know, moves towards a fiscal union. So I'm just saying, if it's true that more integration is possible, how can we make it happen? Uh, given the current political constraints? Uh, so uh, on, on the two questions you asked me, uh, we didn't try government spending in particular, but if we repeat the analysis that I illustrated for the set of questions that concern the role of the state, and they have also questions about the distribution and economy, the results are very similar. So essentially, this is due to the <coughs> fact that there is a, a very large amount of heterogeneity within country, within any country. So we differ in our perspective as Italians and Germans uh, towards uh, the role of the state, but these differences are minute compared to the differences that we see within countries. Um, on uh, the, the second question, I think you are right. Uh, there is uh, a gap between uh, voters' uh, uh, opinion, aggregate voter or average voters' opinions, and uh, uh, the stance of European policy making. 
in a sense, what I would argue is this is because we are not uh, a, a political union. We don't have political institutions that somehow uh, manage to influence the policy making at the European level. So uh, uh, it's not surprising that uh, the European vision is less responsive to what uh, citizens are saying because it's filtered by bargaining at the, at the European Council. Uh, and so uh, that's something that, of course, reflects the importance of the, the secondary importance of the European Parliament and the way in which institutions are designed. Uh, but it's not necessarily an immutable fact of, of European integration. And I think the, the, the challenge that uh, we face uh, inside our own countries and uh, in the Eurozone is, is in, in all advanced democracies is probably uh, the fact that uh, modernization, globalization technology is creating winners and losers and is creating new cleavages in society. And we, inside our countries and inside the European Union, we have not yet found a way to cope with uh, these new cleavages that are going to, to get worse. Uh, the agglomeration economies, the benefits of the people who are more integrated and more educated will continue to grow relative to those that are left behind. Uh, and uh, that's a huge challenge uh, for Europe and for any advanced democracies. And I don't think we have found a way to cope with this. Well, you know, in, in terms of the, let me, let me comment mainly on the question whether, you know, there are certain areas where the, where the European discourse may have been um, particularly challenged and, and possibly deteriorating. And one obvious one, uh, which also concerns us very much in this room, is the question since the Euro crisis, you know, how countries and how different societies and politicians have been um, have been uh, analy analyzing the causes and discussing the, the, the culprits. Uh, this is obviously a very, very divisive, has been a very divisive and, uh, debate, and it's gotten worse, not better. I mean, I, I really think, I mean, looking at Germany where we're sitting right now, I really think uh, today a majority of, uh, of the population, the general population, and even a majority of economists would have a very, very different analysis about the benefits and costs of the euro than they would have had three years ago. And in particular, they would, it would be a, uh, a deterioration uh, in that sense. You know, the many people have become convinced that Germany was somehow, you know, is, is somehow in this transfer union. And, and, and for some reason, um, it is very hard to, you know, fight this with facts. And vice versa, there is, of course, the other side to that, that uh, where, where countries uh, or uh, societies have become convinced that they, are on, they have been um, cheated. So, so you have, you have uh, clearly some issues where right now we have a situation that is much worse than it was a few years ago. And, um, and, and I think it's partly also really the fault of the, of the elite <laughs> um, that, that there has not been a European, sufficiently European understanding and, and, and uh, emphasis uh, on the common good. When you ask why do we need European institutions rather than you know, intergovernmental solutions, then it's usually because you have a common good problem to solve. And I think many people don't think about Europe in terms of the common good. They think about Europe in terms of bureaucrats that want power or something like that, you know? Uh, it just, it's, it's again, it's in a way, the phrasing, the, 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 the framing of how we are discussing Europe and the Euro um, has not been very productive, uh, to put it very mildly. Um, and, and we have to think very quickly on how to change that. Daniel, on the way forwards and whether we've reached the limits um, and your question, whether we have more intergovernmental decisions. Yes. I disagree. I mean, especially if you think, let's say, 10 years back and today, we are sitting here, right? <laughs> a giant step in banking supervision. But there are also other areas. Think about the public prosecutor, very beginning. Uh, and also even banking supervision, there's a long tail which comes behind that. Um, Frontex. Right? 
little bit of common decision making. Um, so I totally disagree that things are getting worse and worse. On the contrary, we have more and more areas where states, as you showed, Beatrice, as in the US, under crisis and under big resistance, right, have actually agreed among member states and countries that, okay, yes, either a doses of federal institutions or a federal institution is necessary. And, and this is very important that in uh, terms of supervision, uh, it is now accepted and there's no complaints from the industry. I would be worried if now the German banks, the Italian banks, and the French said, ah, it was so much better in the good old times. And they're not saying that. And that's very important. So I disagree uh, with the fact that, A, that, that analysis. Second point is now forward. Because of this divergence in the institutions, uh, I think actually uh, it is true that the intergovernmental method as such becomes less efficient. If you have six very similar countries, you get together, let's say you have a directive, right, to say in precise legal terms, you can assume that it will be transposed more or less in the same way, comma, and then actually applied by national judicial systems in a similar way, right? That among the 27 and with X number of them sliding backwards, you can no longer do. So I would say we have had <coughs> more federal institutions more federal institution making also, but the need, so the, sudden, the, the demand curve, so to speak, has also shifted. We need it even more because of this divergence institutional quality. Yeah, if I may add one, one thought on uh, this general issue of what, what can we do. If my analysis is correct, that, that one big problem we will confront uh, is uh, that nationalism uh, is a reaction to uh, being left behind uh, in this world which is becoming more integrated and, and more, more globalized. Uh, maybe we should change one important uh, uh, way in which we have been thinking about the European integration. So the economic approach to European integration has been, uh, let's <coughs> make uh, the single market work, let's integrate markets, and let's do it in a way that induces competition between systems to make them more efficient, tax competition and other forms of competition between systems. Uh, this has made it more difficult for member states to redistribute in favor of those who are left behind. Uh, but there is no reason why European integration should take this form. European integration could also take the form of empowering the redistributive policies of member states, making it easier to tax the wealthy, making it easier to tax uh, capital, uh, uh, in, uh, making it easier to tax co corporate capital. This may be inefficient, we all understand this, but there have to be trade-offs, and if we need to help those who are left behind, we also need to worry about the fact that the share of labor income in GDP has been falling, the share of capital income has been rising, and uh, maybe we need uh, the help of the European Union to achieve the redistribution that would be needed. This is not a redistribution across member states, but of course it would need to interfere with the, uh, the capacity of member states to compete to attract capital or, or wealth. And seeing the European Union as an instrument for empowering redistributive policies, I think, uh, can be one reaction to these uh, nationalist uh, tendencies. Okay, uh, we have time for, I think, a couple of questions. I won't take more than three, and I've already identified the three, so I am. Uh, <laughs> and I will, I mean, I think Ignacio is allowed the question as well. <laughs> so I'll, uh, I'll take one, two, and three, and Ignacio is the last one. Yeah. I'm Rosa Lastra, and first I would like to thank Ignacio for a wonderful presentation and also for quoting my work. My question relates to the independence, which is also something that has been discussed with the panel, and that is that independence is in the uh, conduct of supervision, of banking supervision, is instrumental in the same way as independence in the conduct of monetary policy is instrumental. It's an instrument in, in the pursuit of a goal, in the case of central banking monetary policy, it used to be price stability, which was easily defined and quantifiable.
Independence in the conduct of banking supervision is also instrumental. The problem is that the goal, which is financial stability, is not as easily defined, and also it coexists with other goals. And also that independence in supervision is not the same as independence in monetary policy, because at the end of the supervisory cycle, the result is the possibility of crisis, and with crisis comes at the end of the spectrum the possibility of bank recapitalization with the involvement of the government. So this complicates the conduct of supervision. And I would like to hear uh, from the panel and then later perhaps from Ignacio about this instrumental nature. They, you have also been talking about the independence of the judiciary. And that's, I think, a very important element because that's part of the accountability that central banks have, both with regard to monetary policy and supervision. And independence of the judiciary is not an instrument. It's actually a principle. It's a constitutive part of the rule of law. And therefore, we need to protect it and to take care of that. And that's perhaps something in which I would, like to, I would also like to hear from the panel. And then finally, a methodological point I would like also to give thanks to Ignacio for mentioning the law and the legal literature. I think we need to have a better interdisciplinary dialogue when we talk about supervision and financial stability between law and economics, because otherwise we will end up with bad laws or bad policies. At the front. Uh. Uh, professor, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I have a broad question, but it was a broad uh, paper and a, and a broad um, panel in general and a broad conference. Uh, this extraordinary finding of that Guido presented suggest nations are not about preferences, they're not made of preferences, not even endogenous preferences, they're made of institutions. So the next question is, can we separate out the, the role of political institution from the role of economic institutions in this regard? Uh, ben Friedman, Harvard University. I have both a, one ob observation and then a question for uh, Guido. The observation, is that at least uh, based on our evidence in the US, the kind of cultural and political attitudes that you are uh, examining turned out to be very, very durable over time, uh, which is uh, discouraging from the perspective of thinking that we can change them through things like economic success or policy. Just uh, one, one example, uh, the areas of New York State that either supported or resisted ratification of our Constitution in 1788 are almost identical to the areas of New York State that voted for either uh, Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump in 2016. Uh, no matter how much you studied the history uh, and the electoral results, if I showed you the two maps, if I showed myself the two maps, I could not tell the two maps apart. So this is very discouraging from the perspective of hoping to correct these situations. Second, a question. Uh, you mentioned that your work uh, drew on questions in the value survey about religiosity. I'm wondering about uh, the role of religion as opposed to religiosity. Again, because the motivation is that results for the U.S. indicate that the kinds of uh, attitudes and preferences that we're discussing here, things like attitudes toward government, attitudes toward modernization, attitudes toward uh, integration, and so forth, are very heavily correlated, not with religiosity, but with the religion. Oh, in, for example, in Alberto Alazina's latest paper with Stephanie Stencheva, there's this nice map of the United States with uh, various differences in uh, attitudes. It turns out to be almost indistinguishable from a map of the United States showing the prevalence of uh, Protestant evangelical uh, denominations. And so I'm wondering whether here in Europe where you have um, almost as much uh, religious heterogeneity as we do, whether you've investigated that, and if so, what the results show. And 
dulcis in fundo. Well, harmonizing religion seems to be difficult, so. <laughs> no, I, I was, uh, I wanted to ask, I mean, the, 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 there are two uh, big drivers, seems to me, of many of the phenomena that you have analyzed, and one is insecurity. Personal insecurity, economic job insecurity, and financial insecurity also as a result of crises, etc. Uh, and the other one is perception, so the extent to which perceptions and information tend to diverge from reality. And, and I was wondering whether you have some thoughts to offer on the extent to which, uh, you know, these two things can uh, explain some of the phenomena, also because both of them more or less came up in the last uh, 15, 20 years, or at least they were aggravated significantly in the last 20 years, and that's where we see some of the anti Europe, uh, you know, and the we first attitudes emerging. So there is a certain simultaneity, uh, and uh, and also I think if, if if indeed these two elements are important, then already to some extent the policy policy agenda would emerge uh, because insecurity, you know, um, uh, ways of promoting risk sharing through public intervention or even financial education and insurance education, which is, which is not very well advanced in many European countries, could help from this point of view. And, uh, and as far as perceptions of con of con are concerned, of course, the truth is a public good. Uh, but uh, governments are not often engaged primarily you know, or directly in promoting the truth and giving the right information. So that, that could be something that uh, I think that's important because, for example, security is a sense of people more secure uh, tend to be more open towards others in general, both, I think, within countries and across countries. And so if these two drivers are indeed important, at, at least we know what we are supposed to do. Okay, why don't you answer the last three questions, because I think they were yeah. directly di directed yeah. at the paper, and perhaps you can comment on uh, uh, Professor Lastra's yeah. questions. Uh, so let me start with Ignacio's. Uh, uh, forgive me if I refer to another paper of mine, but uh, I think what you were suggesting is, is very, very interesting, and I've been working on, on, on this issue with Nicola Gennaioli. So uh, there is a lot of evidence in other work, for instance, work by Luigi Guizzo with co-authors uh, of what you said, that economic insecurity is correlated with nationalism and uh, with uh, uh, voting uh, for right-wing parties. There is evidence that regions more exposed to competition from China uh, are also behaving in that way. So I think it, it is a solid fact that economic insecurity is correlated with these phenomena. Uh, so one idea that uh, we are exploring is to think uh, about the, the, the fact that these sh shocks are uh, correlated with uh, uh, identification with social groups. So in, let, me, let me see if I can explain this in two minutes. Uh, so there is a large literature in uh, social psychology that suggests that your beliefs and your view of the world is affected by the social identity that you have with the groups with which the, you identify and the uh, parties with which you identify. And there is a lot of evidence that uh, beliefs about uh, policy issues are affected by whether you are a Republican or a Democrat, you are a left-winger or a right-winger. Positive facts about climate change, about uh, the consequences of policy intervention. So one idea, which I think is, is worth exploring, is that uh, these economic insecurities and these shocks are changing your political identities and your social identities. You used to identify with the left or with the right, and this was associated with specific belief distortions, uh, that you were a beneficiary of uh, uh, specific types of redistribution. And now, uh, new economic shocks are making you change your identity, and you identify with uh, your region, with your nation, with a social group that differs in other ways, and this changes your belief distortions. You no longer uh, 
stereotype on the left versus right dimension. You stereotype on being in favor or against immigrants, in favor or against globalization. Uh, and so I very much share your view that economic shocks matter because they change your beliefs in uh, this particular way, in changing the political group or the social group with which you feel a part of and creating new cleavages. And, and so this may amplify uh, political conflict and change the political consequences of economic shock. So I think that that's uh, something that I find very interesting. Uh, on the other two questions, I, I have less to say because I agree with uh, Ben that uh, the content of religion also matters. Of course, this is incorporated in our data because we look at differences across countries. So I don't think it would change the message of uh, the analysis, but I agree that that's an important uh, cleavage and, and uh, correlated with, with many uh, uh, aspects of, of our beliefs. Um, and you are right that there is a surprising degree of durability in these attitudes, although the pictures that uh, I had shown also shows uh, that uh, attitudes towards Europe uh, are affected by economic events. And uh, what I was saying in response to Ignazio's comment uh, is one mechanism in which uh, you may change your beliefs and attitudes if, if you change your uh, social identities. Um, with regard to the point made by Jeanne, um, I perhaps would not agree with your statement uh, that countries only differ by institutions. I think I, national identities are a cultural feature that are very important. Uh, I think countries differ because they, the citizens feel that they belong to a particular community, uh, which is defined by history, by language. This community does not influence their view about what policy should be or what government should be doing but it influences their willingness to redistribute, to compromise, and, and to accept collective decisions. So there is more than just institutions. There is a tradition associated with the national identities, which is very important and ought to be changing. Uh, on whether institutions differ, we understand that political institutions are very different. Uh, I'm not sure that national institutions in Europe are so different. The broad features of our labor markets and the way in which the economy is organized uh, are, are, not, are not so different, I would argue, but you may dispute this. Okay. Thank you. Uh, quick comment to the question on the importance of the judiciary and uh, judicial institutions. Well, that's what I mm -hmm. <laughs> emphasized, so I, I fully agree. As I said, in Europe we have the additional dimension between the national and the European part of it. And uh, part of what the European supervisors do is regulated by and also judged by a European institution. But other parts, then actual actions on a Spanish bank, then is judged in Spanish courts. And then uh, you are thrown back also to the quality of the national league institutions. And that's why I'm saying in Europe, we cannot uh, look at the institutions we have at the central level independently of the quality of the institutions at the national level, and their deterioration uh, poses a grave danger. Well, I would uh, approach it uh, by saying you know, independence in the case of uh, supervision is, of course, more difficult to define than, uh, and has more aspects than for monetary policy, and essentially because for monetary policy, you can say, independence for what? And so the, the what that you are defining, the goal, can be measured in real time all the time. You know, you can define it very precisely, uh, inflation at X percent. Um, whereas the other way of looking at the independence is to say from what? And the, here I think it's the more relevant one. It's the independence from specific um, special interests. That's essentially what you're trying to, to secure uh, through the supervision, making supervision not local. And in a very similar way, I think the way to think about this is uh, for competition policy. That's also why independent competition policy is equally important in order to uh, 
secure independence from special interest. And this is not only industry and companies. This also refers increasingly in the, in the age of Trump uh, to nations, because uh, increasingly there has been almost an acceptance, um, I feel, that there are such things as national interests um, that, uh, that are different from the interests of the other nation, um, you know, my champion versus the other champion type uh, story, which is very much based on, on, the, on the notion of the deal and in many ways is contrary to enlightened self-interest. Uh, but, that's, uh, but the more this takes hold, the more uh, people think in terms that my national interest is, uh, is different from the national interest of the other country, the more you actually need uh, international institutions to, to secure that the, the rules of the game uh, are the same for countries. Well, we've taken 10 minutes of your coffee break, so I think we should really stop here, but please join me in thanking our panelists for a really fascinating discussion.